The Mini IT11 is another cute, powerful, nux style mini PC from the folks over at Geekom, and it represents something I love to see in the world of PC tech. Older, high-end machines reduced to more attractive prices, rather than simply being discontinued. Unlike new budget models, you get a more premium product with fewer cut corners, in this case with an Intel 11th Gen i7 and Iris Xe graphics. However, mobile CPU tech has come a long way in the last two and a half generations. Does that make this otherwise quite modern mini PC already obsolete? The Mini IT11 was provided for me to review by Geekom. I receive no money or commission for doing so, and Geekom have no input or editorial control over the review. However, the first PC I ever tested of theirs was the 13th generation i9 model, which, while flawed, did have some very attractive points, and might just have spoiled me for what to expect from a mini PC. This 11th gen i7 model, meanwhile, has half the performance cores and threads, half the level 3 cache, no efficiency cores, and a slightly lower TDP. The i7 11390H is a quad-core 8-thread CPU with boosts up to 5GHz. Unlike the 11th generation desktop chips, this is built on 10 nanometer Tiger Lake architecture, which is a point in its favour, but the 28 watt TDP is probably still going to hold it back. The BIOS didn't seem to offer any way of increasing the limit, and none of the half dozen versions of Intel XTU I tried would start up or even install in some cases. The only luck I had was with the Universal x86 tuning utility, which allowed me to manually turn the TDP up to 35 watts, and the result was… the CPU almost immediately overheated as soon as I started the benchmark and the whole PC shut down. I think it stuck at 28 watts. On the positive side, the rest of the specs are pretty impressive. The current sale price in the UK is £449, or $499 in the US, and there's a discount code in the description for an additional £20 or dollars off. For that, you get 32GB of user-replaceable dual-channel DDR4-3200 and a socketed 1TB NVMe SSD. It has Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2, just like the latest model, an internal SATA header if you want to make a nice, neat home server setup with a 2.5-inch drive, and the external port selection is almost as good as the 13th Gen 2. On the front, there's one USB-A, one USB-C, and a 3.5mm combo jack. On the left, we have my favourite feature of Geekon PCs, the full-size SD card slot. And on the back, there are two USB-A, one Type-C, an HDMI 2 and mini display port, as well as an Ethernet jack. Why are they only almost as good? Well, I did say mini display port rather than full-size. And while both the Type-C ports are USB 4 and support power and display, they're only rated up to 20 gigabits and so aren't Thunderbolt compatible. That means it can handle up to four external displays, but won't handle most consumer eGPUs. The final factor going in this PC's favour is its integrated graphics. The Iris Xe has 96 execution units, running at up to 1400 MHz, and supports Intel QuickSync video encoding and decoding for pretty much all formats except AV1. This will help immensely for video playback, and while gaming performance won't likely compete with RDNA 3 graphics in some of the more modern AMD-powered mini PCs, it's also a few hundred pounds cheaper than them. Let's start with the synthetics. In CPU-Z, the 11th Gen i7 doesn't impress. Single thread performance is decent, pulling slightly ahead of the Zen 2 APU in the Nipoji Mini PC I tested last week, but it's still almost 30% behind the 13th Gen Intel CPUs. In multi-threaded, it's a massacre. The i7 was beaten by the Ryzen 7 5700U, a CPU based on old Zen 2 architecture, by about 90%. Cinebench is more of a torture test on mobile CPUs, as there's very little chance they won't throttle, so the margin shrinks somewhat between the i7 and the other CPUs I tested. It doesn't change the order, however. With a multi-core score of 4775, it's still being outclassed by the Ryzen, and the horribly throttled i9 still managed to score more than double. 
Geekbench 6 is probably the best result for the quad core. Its single thread score is a very respectable 2058, and the multi thread score of 5578 is only about 15% behind the 8 core Ryzen 7. So, CPU benchmarks haven't exactly gone in the i7's favour, but hopefully the Iris Xe graphics will come into their own. Geekbench's OpenCL test went pretty well. At over 13k, it's about even with the newer 80EU version in the 13th Gen i5, and only a little behind the well-regarded Vega graphics in the AM02 Pro. In Vulkan, the IT11 scores a pretty excellent 18k, only 10% behind the i9, and beating the Ryzen 7 handily. The Iris Xe is clearly having a positive effect in 3D Mark II. The overall score of 1644 in Time Spy surpasses the Ryzen 7 and the 13th Gen i5, because while the CPU test goes poorly for the i7, the GPU test goes in its favour. The IT11 does lose out to the i5 machine in Firestrike by a small margin overall, but a huge margin in the physics test. I ran two real-world productivity tests, DaVinci Resolve and Blender. Starting with Blender, and it's not good news. The lack of GPU acceleration is a shame, but none of the others have it either. So it's not an excuse for why the 11390H only finished the classroom render in 20 minutes. This score is still twice as fast as the N100, but 12 to 13 minutes slower than the 13th gen mini PCs. In Resolve, I rendered a 5 minute 4K 60 clip using footage from my Fujifilm X-T3 camera, and in the H.264 test without GPU acceleration, it completed in 49 minutes 39 seconds, which is about the worst result in this test so far. In H.265, the GPU comes into play, and so finishes in just over 11 and a half minutes. This is actually faster than the other Intel chips, and only a couple minutes behind the Ryzen 7. Booting into Apex Legends was something of a slideshow, even at 900p with settings dropped to low. I didn't grab any footage of the home screen, but it was at like 6fps. Things eventually evened out, and the frame rate climbed to an unsteady 60fps, but this wasn't a good omen. In gameplay, it just about managed to average over 50fps, but 1% lows were below 30. BattleBit Remastered is going to be an exception to the rule, in that the Mini IT11 can run it at some pretty high frame rates at 1080p potato settings, but it's still not my idea of a great experience. The 1% lows are only half of the average, so that means for a distinctly choppy frame graph at times. Counter-Strike 2 was borderline unplayable and I tried two matches to be sure. The first one was a stuttering mess in the first minute or two, before eventually settling down. The second match was better all round, and is the one I took the benchmark results from, but better doesn't mean good. The average at 1080 low was 49 FPS, with 1% lows of 28. I wanted to use the replay function of Fortnite, but it crashed every time I tried, so like with CS2, I had to run a few matches to get things running smoothly. And again, smooth is a very relative term. In performance mode, the average is over 60 FPS, but 1% lows are once more in the 20s. Overwatch 2 was literally impossible to play at 1080p native resolution. The home screen was in single digits, gameplay barely passed 10 FPS, and I was essentially useless to my team. Dropping resolution scaling down to a manual 50% of 1080p, with everything else still at minimum, brought a surprisingly big leap to over 50 FPS on average, but the lows are still less than half that. Not gonna lie, I've been pretty disappointed with the usual gaming results, so I tried a Hail Mary in the form of GTA V, a game which surely wouldn't let me down. Well, no, actually, no, it, it, it was okay. At 1080p normal, the frame rate wasn't far off what I saw in Apex Legends, with a 51 FPS average and 28 FPS 1% low, but in the context of a non competitive single player game, it's a bit more tolerable.
Civ 6 has yet to impress me on a mini PC so far, and while one day I'm sure I'll be surprised by a mobile CPU in this game, it's, it's not today. The best turn time I saw was an average of 9.45 seconds, which isn't the worst result I've ever seen, but only because I tested the N100 the other week. Put it this way, the i7 performs worse than a Pentium G3258. The final viable use case for mini PCs that a lot of people seem to like them for is emulation, and for once I think I've found some games the PC doesn't struggle with. PS2 emulation is pretty much flawless in Gran Turismo 4, CMU can run Mario Kart 8 with only very occasional frame drops, and while Rogue Leader for the GameCube and Tatsunoko vs Capcom for the Wii have significantly more in the way of stutter, this is far from the worst I've seen lately. On the whole, I'm a little disappointed with a Mini IT11. In a vacuum, it's fine. It's perfectly capable of holding its own in more challenging tasks like video editing, but it does lean pretty heavily on the Iris Xe graphics. For example, anyone using the free version of DaVinci Resolve will want to export in H.265, as the CPU encoder is slow as molasses. It's more than going to fit the bill for general use, photo editing, web browsing and streaming video, and it does pretty well at emulation too. Gaming is the real letdown. Older AAA and less demanding indie titles should be fine, but anyone looking to play even lightweight competitive games will be disappointed. While I want to champion older tech, the Mini IT11 sits in an awkward place. In many tasks, a similarly aged and priced Ryzen powered unit can outperform it. And if you want much better performance from Intel's own CPUs, you don't have to look far. Keep an eye out next week when I'll have a review of the 12th gen model. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.